Welcome to the Zimmerman Podcast with your host, CEO, wedding professional, educator, and mom, Jessica Zimmerman. This is a brand new Zimmerman Podcast mini-series, Sleeping with a Stranger Under the Cover. In the next few weeks leading up to the release of my memoir, Sleeping with a Stranger, we'll be taking a look under the cover as I share insider information about the story and process behind my memoir, Sleeping with a Stranger, which releases May 7, 2020. I'm sitting down with Rachel, who will be interviewing me about the deeply personal and never before shared details of my journey through living and writing Sleeping with a Stranger. So let's do this. Let's go under the cover. Okay, here we are. Hey, Rachel. Hi, Jess. How's it going? We are here for um, another Under the Cover series episode. I think everyone's going to be very excited about this one because we actually have a third guest today. And who would that be? This is my husband, Brian Zimmerman. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me. I think, Brian, you might be the most um, eagerly anticipated guest, the most demanded guest for the Under the Cover series. So thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Absolutely. You should see his face right now. He's like, (laughs) yes, I am. Of course. Look at me. I mean, he hasn't had a, we're in the middle of quarantine, so he hasn't had his normal haircut every four weeks. So it's a little longer. He's like running his fingers through it. He's like, yeah, I'm most requested. (laughs) Well, yeah, we are in the middle of quarantine, which means like we all have kids. They're running somewhere, hopefully (laughs) occupied for the time that we record this. And so, you know, there could be an interruption that we have to edit out later. At any moment. Yeah, Yeah. it could totally happen. And we're just going to roll with it. Absolutely. So Brian, we, I mean, there are so many questions addressed to you. I don't even know where to start, but there are some of them that we are saving for um, the special behind the scenes kind of backstage pass that is exclusive to people who buy the audio book when it becomes available in May. So if you want Brian to answer, to he- if you want to listen to Brian's answers to hear kind of all the behind the scenes follow up questions about his health journey and um, just sit down with Jess and Brian as they answer more extensive questions. That's going to be a special Q and A session that's going to be available only to people who buy the audiobook. And you send your receipt in to um, it's going to Kelly at JessicaZimmerman dot com. So you buy the audiobook, which will be available in May. And if you buy the audiobook, you just screenshot your receipt, email it to Kelly, K-E-L-L-I-E at JessicaZimmerman.com, and she will send you a link. And that is basically your invitation to a live uh, Q&A kind of party with Brian and me, which, by the way, I told Brian about this like last week. Um, And he was like, oh, okay. Um, But basically, what's interesting is we had the advanced reader team, you know, about 50 of them read the book. And then I had a document where I wanted to know, like, what are your thoughts after reading the book? You know, what are your thoughts or what questions do you still have? And, you know, those kinds of things. And everyone was like, wanting to know more about Brian, wanting to ask Brian questions. And so those kinds of things will definitely, you know, be talking about in that special kind of Q&A. But today, I think we're just going to kind of talk about the fact that, you know, I think a lot of people probably read this book and go, did did Brian know she was writing this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, and that, that actually makes me, um, it makes me excited that, that people are asking, you know, what's, you know, what what's going on with Brian? How how is he now? What uh, what did he think about all this? And just like Jess said, what did he what did he think about her sharing that? And that to me just speaks um, uh, speaks to what we're what we're trying to share here. I know that um, I sure was excited to. Well, I'll just back up and say normally this is not like me. Very private. I don't like to share a lot of things. Um, don't you know? I would I would. A lot of people who know me would think, wow, that that doesn't really sound like did, you know, did Brian know that she was sharing that? But that is exactly what I wanted this to be. I wanted to be able to share this. I wanted this when Jess told me she wanted to share this story and how this was all coming together 
Um, and I just felt led to share it. It's yeah. not that I des- necessarily like wanted to share. I don't think it's a story anybody wants to share. I just felt in my heart that I was supposed to share it. Like the experience happened to us because we were supposed to share it. And this, yes. And, you know, that this story that this, that my portion happened to me and why did it happen to me? You know, those, these have been questions that, you know, I've dealt with still dealing with over, you know, the past five, six years or whatever it has been. But I do know that it was very clear to me at that moment that, yes, I wanted to, share whatever needed to be shared in this story that this was a that this was a wonderful opportunity to 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 share that to whomever and you know whoever could would buy this book and and uh, hopefully it would get to someone that that it would really you know strike and give hope to and like wow that is exactly or not exactly what I was dealing with but that is um you know, that, you know, something that resonated with someone that someone that can grab a hold of and say, me too, Ron, I was there. I dealt with that same thing, Is that, you know? Yeah. I think when we were, <laughs> I still say we, um, when you were going through this illness, um, you felt very alone. Like it was just like, absolutely. No one has this. No one on the planet has this. I'm the only one. And it was just such an isolating and lonely time. And so uh, let me be clear, we could have written the book and just said, Brian didn't feel well, Brian had an illness, we, we didn't have to get specific about the illness, we could have just said an illness. Um, You know, and I'll excuse me, I'll jump in here. And that's when I was very clear that I think I I think I would jumped in a few times, you know, as we read the drafts as as the months moved along and said, I think we need to go a little deeper here, you know, and well, and, you know, in approving things or in recommending things and um because you wanted to you wanted to be very transparent and you wanted it to be you know, you wanted it to be as real life as it as yeah. it was. Well, and I think that there's I would say the two darkest moments of your life are in the book. You know, and I know that the people who have read it have, you know, they have cringed and they have felt heartbroken. You know, Mm -hmm. I think anyone who's read it knows the two moments we're talking about, just that cringe moment and then that heartbroken moment. And it's like if we were to write this book without those two incidents, then other people might go, well, he didn't have it as bad as I do. So. I think it, you really said to me, if you're going to share this story, you have to share all of it. You have to be as honest as possible. And I just thought, I don't know another human being on the planet who would who would do that, especially another man. I don't know another man on the planet who would say to his wife, yeah, share the darkest, most embarrassing moments of my life and put it in a book for the world to read. So I think that that's just really, I think that just shows the the fact of how that we collectively feel like we were given this experience to share it almost like it's not even ours. Like it's, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I would agree with that. Absolutely. That's a good way to, good way to put it. Well, and we have already gotten so much feedback from people who have read the book and just have, they felt for the first time for many of them, like finally understood, finally, they feel like they're not alone, even in the specific diagnosis that, you know, it ends up being revealed. It's just kind of this collective deep breath of, oh my goodness, it's such a relief to know that it's not just me. Um, And that doesn't, it's not like that didn't cost anything emotionally to share those things. I know that as heavy as those things are, and as sure as you felt about your purpose and sharing it, there were probably times when maybe not thinking about strangers reading it, but thinking about people who know you, maybe not your best friend, but like that middle layer of people who know you, but not well enough to have already heard about these things. Just, I, I'm assuming there's probably moments of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe so-and-so could read this or, you know, just kind of, realizing that now all of this stuff, people you see in the grocery store could know about it. Is is any of that, like, as you were so convicted to share the vulnerable things, were there any moments of, 
oh yeah, but that, you know, it's still a choice and it is a big choice. Yeah. I think for me personally, I think I worry about that more than Brian does. I worry about are people going to view Brian still as sick because he's not sick anymore? You know, are they going to look at him and think, you know, about those uh, cringeworthy moments? And I don't want that for him, you know, because he is he is healed and he is so much better. And, you know, we are so much better. And, you know, or or are people going to look at us and think about, you know, I, I write about some some difficult times in our sex life due to the illness, you know, um, and that is so, so much better now, so much better. But it's like how, you know, but you just can't control it. And Brian says that we're never going to be able to control that. Like our job was to share it. And then whatever people take from it is there. And you say that to me all the time. Yeah, it's your story. Whatever. Once it's out there, once they take it, that is how they take it is, is that's them. That's on them. That's how they accept it. And everybody will accept it differently. And I have read other books um, from other authors and then heard about how, you know, different people have come to them and shared, Oh, wow. That's incredible. How in your book that, that resonated with me in my life and all that. And and she, you know, she, she would say, or he would say, I, I didn't tell them at the time, but that, that was not even in my book. You know? <laughs> yeah. That, that they take, they, they get so involved in it and they're going to see it and shape it how they want to see it and shape it. And that's, that's on them. You know, that's once they, once they have the book in their hands, it's on them. That's, that's how they want to accept it. So yeah. if that makes sense. So. Oh, absolutely. When I was back when I was an English teacher, um, you know, we have every year we had standardized testing and there was an example of the a poem that was in one of these standardized tests by the author and the answer to the standardized test, you know, it was D, whatever D was. And the author like took a picture of the poem and was like, that is definitely not what this poem was about. <laughs> And just to show that the standardized test was wrong and, you know, that she wrote the poem and she was like, no, that's not what's happening here. So, yeah, people can make it about, you know, you're always projecting yourself and your own experiences onto anything um, you read. And and writers know that that's the whole interaction of a, a reader and a writer. But, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's funny how little control there is over how people perceive different things in the story. I was going to say, I to go back to what you asked about, that's interesting. You said that because about how, you know, are you thinking about as this story is coming out, you know, it's available by ebook now and people are getting to read these words and people are responding and people, you know, um, all of that. It's interesting because uh, I'm going back to what you said about those, those folks, the, that middle layer. I thought, I think that's interesting because that has actually started to hit me and it doesn't it's not really bothering me it's just you know mentioned earlier it, it it doesn't really i mean whether it's a complete stranger somebody i've known my whole life or somebody i just see at my daughter's school or something you know every now and again they just or like know, your dentist it doesn't you know really, what i mean yeah, it's like it's, yeah there's all those different layers you're right and so but i'm not worried about what they might you know, how they might perceive me if it would be different now or whatever. Again, that's on them, the story out there. And, and I just, I, I felt, I felt led to, to share it to, to a degree that I never thought I would, I would allow that to be honest. Cause that's, again, that's not me. I'm more of a private person, but for some reason, this was a no brainer for me. And I said, absolutely. You put whatever, you know, you know, let, let's really, let's really put this out there and let's be real as we can about it. And, um, and let's do this. I, I think, was all in. Yeah. I think unless you really, really know Brian and there, you know, I think there are a few people that, that really, really know him, you know, like, uh, in the deepest sense of the way, like, um, there are people who think they know him, you know, but there, if you really know him, then this doesn't come as a surprise that he would be willing to share this because he's that selfless and he's that giving and he's all about helping other people. And, um, and he is very, very, very brave in, in, in that way. I think what's probably hard is that, you know, there are people that 
you know, we've had total strangers reach out and say such kind things. And then there are some members, you know, that are, we're very close to that we haven't even heard from, you know, and so it's like, okay, um, you know, you just, I, I think that's been a little hurtful for, for Brian, but that's, that's okay. You know, we, we get through it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, and that's how everybody wants to respond how they want to respond, you know, and that's their, that's on them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their, their way to interpret, their way to, to respond. That's not me to say how anybody should respond or interpret it. I can't control that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I, I'm sure, I mean, the truth is that there's no way to go back in time and, you know, not live through all the things that you lived through. And I'm sure now, because it caused so much to come up in your life and your marriage that has, you know, ended up being a positive and life-giving thing, I'm not sure you would, but it has to give some purpose to all the pain you went through now. Like you can't undo those things, but if you're, if you are willing to share them, then they become, they have this higher purpose that they wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. So I'm sure there's part of it. That's like, it is kind of, um, rewriting that part of the story because there is such purpose now into what you experienced. If you love Zimmerman Podcast and you end each episode thinking, gosh, I just need more of this in my life, boy, have I got the thing for you. I just got back from recording the audiobook for Sleeping with a Stranger, and something about recording the book out loud made me both excited and terrified. It is by far the most exposed I'd ever felt, but for a listener, it's the most personal way to take in the story. As a special treat, I'm releasing my audiobook seven days early on May 1st. And if you buy the audiobook in the month of May and email your receipt to Kelly at jessicazimmerman.com, that's K-E-L-L-I-E at jessicazimmerman.com, you will be given a backstage pass to an online Sleeping with a Stranger special event with me and special guest Brian Zimmerman. He's kind of the leading man in the story. So set a reminder for May 1st and buy the audiobook and email us your receipt to claim your backstage pass. Go to sleepingwithastranger.com to snag the audiobook on May 1st. And I think that, uh, I mean, for me, I've always had this kind of weird, sick intuition about things, like this gut... I don't want to say psychic because that Brian says don't say that because I sound crazy, but it, it it does. But you do have you do have that, and it's 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 it's. I can freaky. usually kind of predict what's going to happen, and when um, it's almost like I get a like a flash forward, like hey, here's your life in two years or something. It's like it's weird, but I I do I get that, and um, I guess it was. It was in 2016 um, when you were in like the thick of it, when we were like in the hospital and stuff. And when um, I remember saying to you, this isn't for nothing. This isn't for nothing. Um, I believe that this is going to, you know, that we're going to, this is somehow going to be a testimony one day, or we're going to share this one day. Like I just, I believed that. And then there's a moment in the book where I say, Brian was laying down and he was just kind of unrecognizable to me. And I was writing in a journal. And I only write in a journal when I am really kind of, I'm not one that writes, you know, daily in a journal. I only kind of write when I'm kind of at my lowest, you know, and I was writing in it and I wrote, I'm officially sleeping with a stranger. And this was in 2016. And I circled sleeping with a stranger. I still have it. And I remember saying to myself, oh, that's my book title. That's the book title for this story. And like, that was the last thought I had about it until, you know, about a year later. But I just always knew that we would share this one day and that, you know, my job was to share it as excellently as possible and get it out there and as truthfully as possible. And then where it goes is where it goes. Right. Um. So 
Brian, I want you guys to talk a little bit about the day that just got the call that it was kind of the green light to actually start writing the book. Um, and I know that you guys went on a drive and Jess was like sobbing. <laughs> like she doesn't, she doesn't normally like, you know, heave sob. Um, but I know she did that day. So was that the moment for you where it was kind of like, yes, go ahead. Like I feel total peace about this or what, just tell me what that day was like. Oh, what day was that? I would say that was part of it for me. It was even earlier I believe than that um maybe or was it after when at the end of this past summer when I was working at my previous job when we were really trying to figure everything out you had mentioned to me about this and then how it was just kind of well the story felt complete I think so yeah and then that's when that was kind of my moment when when because this past, you know, all of most of 2019, like the beginning of it, it was just very confusing for me of where this was all leading to and why and where we were at the moment. And then when she and I had a conversation, I remember we were in our kitchen and you kind of hadn't brought the book up in a while. I mean, she's brought this up to me, you know, through, oh, through time, you know, so yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like this was just out of nowhere. No, yeah, yeah. And then you brought this up and I haven't heard, we haven't discussed that in quite some time or you haven't mentioned it to me. And then all of a sudden you came to me with this, just this assurance and there's this clarity of like, I think, I think we're, I think I've got this. I think I know think I know how I don't know exactly how you said that and then it just well, all kind just of flashed always... in my mind of you're exactly right this is this is perfect you know and that's when she and I just started just kind of spitting it back and forth of and it was this and this and that's what led to that and that and then this is what and then it was all just kind of a that that scene from a movie when you've all seen that movie where things just kind of like rapidly fire and, you know, across the screen, like this big swirl of thing. And I was like, that's exactly, it just all makes sense. It just all makes sense. That's exactly right. And then I think it was probably, okay. I remember the conversation she's talking about the drive. I mean, so. And then it was, yeah, it was two weeks later, I think when I got the call about, uh, you know, doing the TED talk. And if you do a TED talk, then they'd like you to have a book out, you know, kind of thing. And so that was that. Okay. Yes. And that was the tie in of it's time to do it. Yeah. That was like the, because at first, you know what it's like when you, when you make a decision yourself. So you and I had kind of made this decision of like, yes, yes, it's time. Yes. And then to, for like a week or two later to get such clarity from someone completely out of the blue, who I'd never, ever, ever discussed this book with ever Yes, for her to say, do you have an idea for a book? Yeah. Um, that, that I was... know the team to put you with to make this book happen and like all that. And I just was like, what? And then Brian and I went for a drive and I just fell apart, lost yeah. it. Yeah. It was, that was pretty incredible the way, the way all that went, the way all that went down and how you were, ha- again, you were having this conversation with someone who didn't know you, didn't yeah. know anything about this. And she was just, all of a sudden it was just all it just seemed like, oh, wow. Yeah. And then that is just like, okay, that lined up, that lined up. This is, this is pretty, pretty cool. You know how, when you ask for a sign, <laughs> like that was like, oh my gosh, this is like 97 signs saying, yes, yeah. do it, go for it. That's what that day felt like for me. And everything that I had ever done made sense. It was almost, it was, I will never, I don't know if I'll ever have a day like that again, ever in my life where I just felt like, my entire life made sense. I no longer questioned anything in my life, like everything from my sister's death to why I got in the floral business to why I, you know, shared vulnerably about my business, like everything made sense because it was like, it all prepared me to share this story. It just all made such sense. And I felt, I felt a peace that I had never, ever felt in my life. And it was overwhelming to the point where I was the hyperventilating sobbing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you had to pull over the car. Yeah, I did. It was, uh, I remember it very vividly. And then I'm sobbing and then a song comes on. I go listen to the song. Yeah. And that was, 
that was pretty cool too. And then the sobs got louder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I think was the lyric like God's not done writing your story or something like that. Yep. That was it. God's not done with you. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So it was kind of crazy. Um, well, and I think it's so interesting just listening to you talk. I won't delve too much into the book because I want people to read it, but one of the big takeaways um, is just this idea of not falling into, not needing to prescribe to traditional roles of what it looks like to be a wife and what it looks like to be a husband, kind of breaking out of that. Um, sometimes it can just be, you know, uh, old generational habits or like a Southern mentality, whatever it is. And one of the main takeaways is that, um, and you talked about this, I think you said something about this last week, Jess, but like, you're not living separate lives, but each of you is living your best life and you're partnering in it. And when I think about the fact that Brian, so much of this story is your experience with your sickness, your illness, and then Jessica being the one telling the story, it's, it's just a testament to that. It's really living out that idea that there can be a different way for all of us to live out this partnered life. When you choose a partner you want to be with for forever, that like something might happen to you, Brian, and you were the one who had to live through that. And that was your story. And yet Jessica is telling the story of how it impacted both of you. And those take two different sets of skills, two different personalities, two different, you know, two different people living into who they were created to be. And when you let each other kind of be what you were created to be, then it becomes this incredible story that everyone who reads it gets to find, you know, healing and purpose and just kind of that feeling of being seen and known and heard. And I think that's pretty special. Here, here's what I think. I think what you're saying is so on point. And here's what I think about it. And I say this all the time with work, right? With business, that we are all born with these God-given strengths, right? These strengths that are like woven into our DNA. And what happens is during our childhood, we are started to, uh, we're, we're given these scripts and we're told, no, this is how you're supposed to act. This is how you're supposed to behave. This is what you're supposed to like. You know, you may be really into, you know, playing the piano, but then everyone tells you that, you know, cheerleading is everything and that's what you're supposed to want to do. And that's what you're supposed to, you know, or you may be really into, um, you know, playing the violin and someone tells you that, no, you need to go out for basketball and football and, you know, all these things. Right. And that is when, and then we get into a world where it's like, you need to go to college, or at least for us, this was kind of our lives. You like, it was just expected that we go to college. There was never another option that it was like, you graduate high school, you go to college and, um, you get a degree and then you're going to get a job. And that is what is expected of you when, uh, and what I think happened with Brian's uh, health deterioration is I think my natural born strengths had been um, put on the back burner because I accepted the script role and I was trying really hard to, you know, live by the script. And I think when Brian got sick, my natural born strengths came out and that is when I started to feel, you know, many times like myself, like my truest self, you know, when the business was doing well and, um, and I was getting, I was having these ideas, you know, like BBB and stuff like that, the business behind the blooms. And, um, and, and now what we look at in our relationship is almost our marriage. We look at it, you know, our partnership, what are your top strengths? What are your given strengths? Not what, does the world say they're supposed to be, but what are they really? And who cares if, you know, if mine are more, uh, m you know, traditionally male, you know, or whatever. Brian is so good at taking care of people. Like he is so much more naturally just nurturing and patient and, and those kinds of things. And I am more, you know, driven and futuristic. And so it just if we bring those natural strengths to the table, then our marriage is going to work. If we try to adapt to those script roles, 
that's where the trouble is going to happen. Right. You're not asking, what would a good wife or what would a good husband do? You're asking, how can we create a stronger partnership? How can we do what's best for our family? You know, the five of us for you guys and And what is that going to take from each of us? How can we support our natural strengths for each other? How can we foster each other's dreams? Not how, how can I be a good wife? Not how can I be a good husband, but how can we be who we are together and, and strengthen and foster that. And just like in business, when you say, what is this person's strengths? Okay. I only want them to do those roles that, you know, do those strengths. Because then when you're utilizing your God-given strengths, you never feel like you're working a day in your life. It's the same when you're using that in your everyday life. If you are using and utilizing your everyday strengths, your relationship becomes easier. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with what you said. We've just, um, We've kind of it all. It almost goes back to it was just a uh, we didn't choose this. It just became we we've kind of been in survival mode. Right, the past. we got broken down. Babe. We we did. <laughs> we got broken we did. down. We did, and so it was just kind of how can how do we make this work? What you know? What's the best option going forward? And we just we just went with it. We just were like, I kind of honestly brought the business to it and said, what are your strengths? And what are my, I mean, Brian, even t- I even like had Brian take spring finders and like his like number one strength is adaptability. Like what better strength to have, you know, when raising three children? I mean, it's incredible, you know? So um, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's been, it's been really good. And what you were saying about our lives, like, yeah, I really do view it that way is I am living my life, my independent life. I am not dependent on Brian. Brian is not dependent on me, but I, here's my life. And he chooses to support me and here's Brian's life. And he's choosing to live his life the way he wants to. And I'm going to support him. And when you have that mutual support, mutual respect, that's kind of everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No one's the victim. No one's right. like, I'm giving up the life I thought I would live to support this person's life. Doesn't mean there's not sacrifice for each other, but yeah, no one's the victim. Mm-hmm. And you Absolutely. guys, like you said, you kind of fell into it out of survival, but hopefully people reading it won't have to get to that point of being in survival mode to realize that they can change how they want to you know, what, what things they want to bring into their partnership, what the roles should be for them. I hope not. I hope no one has to go through that. (laughs) I don't ever want to go through it again. It's, it's, it's a lot. And unfortunately there's a lot, there's a lot out there that are. Yeah. And that's, and that's when it goes back to, you know, I know I didn't have it the worst and I know I didn't have it, you know, you know, everybody, the easiest, it's just, everybody has that. And hopefully somebody, that's when somebody will gain, gain, gain something positive, you know, for their life from the story to take and, and, um, and run with it in their life. And I, yeah. And I shared this, I think, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but about that whole, you know, seed analogy, like you've got to just be underground and get broken, you know, um, and walk through the pain before you can kind of, you know, sprout up and become fruitful and things, you know, and you be able to share your gifts and everything. And it's almost, sometimes it's up to us how long we choose to be underground. And for me, because I refuse to give up control, um, I stayed underground. I think I held us underground a lot longer than necessary because I share that in the book when I kind of finally like surrendered, things came together pretty quickly. So I'm sorry I kept us underground for so long. It's okay. Thanks. It's okay. We are we are in a better spot. We are moving forward. Mm. And it it is so hard. I feel like whatever your role is in your marriage, it can be easy to want to control the things that are in your control. Like for Brian, for you, it, maybe it was. Um, being the one who provided a steady income. And even when your body was telling you that it, that was destructive to you, it was probably easy to see that as like your responsibility. And so it was really hard to give up. And just, you know, for you, it could have ended up being, you know, how can I um, pay off my business loan as fast as humanly possible so that 
finances are never a stressor again. Or for mom staying at home, maybe it's, you know, like you have to do every single thing relating to your kids because you can't trust your partner to make dinner the same way you would, or, you know, comb the kids hair the same way you would, or pack lunches the same way you would. But at some point we all have to pay attention to, you know, what kind of, of consequences, good or bad there are for the things that we we have control over and things that we're, like you said, just kind of really hanging on to control over. Yeah. And I think something that really kind of hit with me too, and I don't think I mentioned this in the book, but I, I think I also got to a point where I was like, what kind of example am I showing my children? Like, am I showing my daughter that this is how you live your life? You take on everything and you do everything and you, you know, that's what's expected of you. And am I showing my sons that like, if they choose to marry someday, that that's what, that they have to find someone and that's what they expect of them as someone who does everything. And, you know, and I just thought, no, like that's not, no, you need to start living the life you want your kids to live because they are learning totally through example. Yeah. Sometimes it's way easier for me to say, what would I want for Addie in this situation, which is my daughter, than what would I want for myself? Because it's easier to want, sometimes it's easier to want great things for your kids than it is for yourself. I don't know what that's about, but. Yeah. And I felt that way very strongly when, when I was really contemplating, you know, leaving Brian was, do I stay in this marriage for my children? But also I wouldn't, I wouldn't want this for my children. You know, and it was kind of that back and forth of like, well, what's the right decision, you know? And so it's just interesting. Okay. I'm going to ask one more short question as our outro question. Brian, try to not, you know, don't answer with too much detail, but was there one scene in the book that you read that you had forgotten even happened and you were like, oh my gosh, that was such a fun memory or, oh, I can't, like, I totally forgot that even happened. Uh, when we were on our trip, on our uh, Europe trip back, that seems like a lifetime ago, but that was a moment that I had not thought about in forever and ever when we were in Prague and Jessica saw this painting that she had to have. And man, she told that story so well. That was exactly how it went. And I just, and we carried that painting around for the rest of that trip and babied it all the way home. And now it's framed in our house. And that is a, uh, it's a good story. And it's kind of off on not really in a spot that I see it every day either. So I don't think about that painting, but that is uh, when I, that was a good, that was a good story. Absolutely. There were many of them, but that was, that was absolutely one of them that I hadn't thought about in a while. I love that. Well, if you want to read that story or any of the other things we talked about today, make sure you go and order Sleeping with a Stranger. You can get the ebook or you can pre-order the hardback or the paperback. Or if you want to wait until May, you can order the audiobook and send in your receipt to Kelly at jessicasimmerman.com and get into that exclusive Q&A, get your backstage pass to that. Um, or you can do a combination of any of those. You can get a paperback and an audiobook or a hardback and an audiobook, whatever you want. Just make sure you read this story because I know that it's so chock full of um, stories that you want to read. So yeah. Great. Thanks yeah. for having me. And as always, th- you know, as always, thanks for having me and sorry for my rambling. That's, I love it. That's what I do. That's what you do. I like it. Oh, it was perfect. You did great. I do it too. So you can imagine our home. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's a lot of of chatter. (laughs) And our our kids. And our kids are the same. The same way. So there's a lot of, it's my turn. I get to talk. I I, I was speaking. Yeah. (laughs) That's great. Sometimes that's me. (laughs) (laughs) All right, good. Well, uh, yeah, we'll see y'all next time. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Zimmerman Podcast miniseries, Sleeping with a Stranger Under the Cover. Don't forget, you can get book updates and VIP treatment at sleepingwithastranger.com. The book will be available May 7th. I'll see you next time.